In the shadowy realm of nursery rhymes, where whimsy meets wonder, Hey Diddle Diddle, the cat and the fiddle, shrouds itself in an aura of mystic allure. This age-old verse, which on the surface appears to be a mere flight of fancy, conceals a myriad of hidden meanings and veiled origins. Behind the facade of a playful cat's frolic and the haunting notes of the violin, there exists a tantalizing mosaic of mysteries and concealed secrets. Brace yourselves, for within the cryptic folds of Hey Diddle Diddle, a tantalizing riddle beckons those daring enough to decipher its elusive symbolism. Welcome back, Darklings, to The Resurrectionists, where we breathe life into history, delve into ghostly realms, and explore everything that goes bump in the night. If you haven't joined our weird and wonderful family yet, hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell, because trust us, you won't want to miss a single spine-chilling update. Hey diddle diddle, the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon, the little dog laughed to see such sport, and the dish ran away with the spoon. This strange nursery rhyme's origins is thought to trace back to at least the 16th century, and there are even references hinting at its existence in some form for over a thousand years. In early medieval illuminated manuscripts, for example, the imagery of a cat playing a fiddle is very popular. The third line of the rhyme is where the British expression over the moon originated, meaning joyful elation, which only adds to the intrigue. Yet the precise beginnings of this rhyme continues to elude us, shrouded in a veil of captivating theories. On the surface it seems like nonsense, a mere playful rhyme with no apparent meaning. But what if, lurking beneath its whimsical facade, lies a hidden code? One tantalising theory dares to suggest that it is far from nonsense. Instead, it conceals a secret map. Picture this, a humble farmer ploughing his fields, the weight of a bountiful harvest resting on his shoulders. For him, timing is everything. Planting the seeds too soon or too late can spell doom for the year's crops. But what if, hidden within a whimsical rhyme, lay the key to unlocking the mysteries of the night sky? Enter the theory, one that weaves together the fabric of farming and celestial wonders. It suggests that this peculiar rhyme is, in fact, a star chart. Each line corresponds to a constellation, like pieces of a celestial puzzle. The cat becomes Leo, the fiddle transforms into Lyra, the cow takes on the form of Taurus, the little dog is none other than Canis Minor, Apollo's bowl becomes the dish, and the spoon is the Big Dipper. But how does this rhyme aid our farmer in his quest for the perfect planting time? It's simple. Once a year, when all these celestial characters gather near the moon in the night sky, it's the telltale sign that the time has arrived to sow the seeds in the field. In an era where literacy was a luxury, and books bestowed upon only a fortunate few, the precious treasury of skills, wisdom and calendar dates all had to be memorised. Within this enchanting rhyme, we glimpse a potential masterpiece of memorization, reminiscent of the songs schoolchildren today commit to memory to remember important information, such as their ABCs or times tables. Hey Diddle Diddle, with its catchy rhythm and playful verses, could have been the perfect vessel for planting knowledge of the night sky deep within the mind of the farmers that needed it. This theory, while captivating, is far from proven. It is a recent hypothesis into the rhyme's origins and demands further investigation to unravel its accuracy. But it is a fascinating idea, a testament to human ingenuity and the enduring magic of stories intertwined with the stars. When delving into the intriguing origins of nursery rhymes, a natural path of inquiry leads us to historical scandals and pivotal events, and we may find a clue in the word diddle, which is a curious choice of lyric. One meaning is to cheat or swindle someone so as to deprive them of something rightfully theirs. It is this sinister word that leads some to ponder whether the origins of this rhyme might be entwined with the tragic tale of a betrayed queen, a sovereign whose world crumbled in a devastating whirlwind of heartbreak and shame. Within a dimly illuminated chamber, on a cold winter morning in the year 1518, an air of anxious anticipation enveloped Catherine of Aragon. She had reached the eighth month of her pregnancy, and so had embarked upon her lying in, a period of quiet withdrawal from the court, a retreat from the world itself. Behind the closed doors of the chamber, men dared not tread, for her private rooms were a sanctuary forbidden to them. In the hushed stillness, only women quietly ventured, serving her every need. 
Tapestries cloaked the windows, shielding the chamber from the outside world, their threads intricately woven to conjure a profound darkness that cast the room into a timeless twilight. Only a solitary window remained ajar, allowing a mere whisper of fresh air and faint light, lest the mother's eyes be afflicted by the blaze beyond. Crucifixes and sacred relics adorned her chamber, offering solace and spiritual fortitude striving to replicate the ambience of a womb's embrace, warm, dark, and serene. But the cruel hand of fate moved swiftly. No sooner had she retreated to her concealed chamber than the agonizing grip of contractions overcame her. She underwent the agonizing ordeal of labor, only to birth a daughter who never tasted the breath of life. The unfathomable depths of grief and sorrow gripped Catherine's heart. This stillborn daughter, marked the culmination of her childbearing journey. As the first wife of Henry VIII, she had birthed multiple children, but all had died in early infancy, with only one lone surviving daughter. The weight of her inability to bestow upon her husband a male heir bore down heavily on her soul. This was her final opportunity, and it had now slipped from her grasp. King Henry became consumed with the idea that God was punishing him, the story's complexity started years before, with Catherine of Aragon marrying Henry's older brother Arthur when they were both just 15 years old. Tragically, Arthur fell seriously ill and died just three months into their marriage. Henry, in due course, took Catherine, his brother's widow, as his wife, and their union blossomed with many years of happiness. But the heartache of losing so many children and the persistent absence of a male heir to the throne left Henry with the haunting notion that God disapproved of his choice of spouse. Therefore, when the young and captivating Anne Boleyn assumed the role of Catherine's lady-in-waiting in the early 1520s and steadfastly refused to share a bed with Henry until they were wed, the king's mind was made up. Catherine had to go. As a country of devout Roman Catholics, divorce was not an option. Henry's only escape lay in the examination of a fateful question. Had Catherine's prior marriage to his brother Arthur been consummated? With her defiance and his obsession, their lives spiralled into a relentless battle of wills. Catherine's courage became her armour as she endured a long and emotionally painful ordeal, cross-examined in court as Henry tried to prove the invalidity of their marriage. The Queen was questioned in humiliating detail about her sexual activity with Arthur, which she denied to the bitter end. She could have surrendered, accepted her fate, and faded into obscurity. But a potent blend of piety and unyielding spirit propelled her to resist, even as the world shifted around her. In the heart-wrenching conclusion of events, Catherine's 23-year marriage to King Henry was finally annulled in 1533. Stripped of her royal standing, she faced exile from the court and the merciless separation from her only surviving child, Mary. This cruel twist of fate meant Catherine would never see her beloved daughter again. Catherine never ceased in referring to herself as the rightful, true Queen of England and Henry's lawful wife by divine right. Until her death, she signed her name, Catherine the Queen, and in her last letter to Henry, she addressed him as, My most dear Lord, King and Husband, ending with the line, Mine eyes desire you above all things. It was this unwavering loyalty that garnered her the nickname Catherine La Fidel, which translates to Catherine the Faithful. Yet, it doesn't require much imagination to draw a subtle link between this name and the cat and the fiddle. Furthermore, Catherine found herself cruelly diddled out of her rightful title and position. In the cryptic verses, the dish absconding with the spoon might symbolise Anne Boleyn's audacious run for power, a symbolic theft of the king and throne itself. As for the other animals in the rhyme, they could potentially serve as veiled references to the myriad of forgotten characters who once populated the tumultuous court of Henry VIII, their stories now fading into the mists of history. As the first wife of Henry VIII, Catherine held a special place in the hearts of devoted Catholics who saw her as the true Queen of England. She was deeply loved by her people for her unwavering faith and dedication. Interestingly, in the years that followed her annulment, many taverns with the name The Cat and Fiddle popped up. Some suggest that these taverns might have been a coded show of support for Catherine and her religion. However, it's important to note that this connection is based on indirect evidence and cannot conclusively prove that the taverns nor nursery rhyme Hey Diddle Diddle was created as a tribute to Catherine. 
However, one theory worthy of consideration is connected to those cat and fiddle public houses. In the past, these establishments often hosted a traditional pub game named Tip Cat, involving a short length of wood known as a cat. The cat is hit with a larger stick to send it flying into the air, at which point the player attempts to hit it a distance with the larger stick while it is still in the air. In one version, the batter tries to round the bases before the fielder retrieves the cat and throws it back to home base. Earlier versions of the game are based on guessing the distance that the cat is hit, scoring points according to the number that comes up on a four-sided cat, and running from base to base on a large circle while the cat is being retrieved. It is a very early pub game, dating to at least the 17th century, that many years later through different evolutions became cricket, rounders and baseball. It's not uncommon for famous nursery rhymes to have their origins in traditional or musical games, making it a plausible notion that hey diddle diddle might be rooted in such a practice. Diddle can mean to pass time aimlessly or unproductively, which would fit with game playing. Fiddles were commonly played at taverns to accompany games, singing and merriment. In this interpretation, the line, the little dog laughed to see such sport, takes on a dual significance. On one hand, it may signify the sheer enjoyment of witnessing a spirited game in progress. Alternatively, it could allude to the virtue of sportsmanship, emphasising the importance of playing fairly and with good humour. Delving further, the mention of the moon in the rhyme might cleverly evoke the image of the expansive circular bases that players enthusiastically traverse during the game. Additionally, the reference to jumping over them may vividly capture a crucial aspect of the game, where players leapt over these bases, adding an element of agility and excitement to the sport. The dish and spoon running away could symbolise the players becoming engrossed in the game and inadvertently missing the opportunity to enjoy their meal before the plate is whisked away by the innkeeper. It's a captivating possibility that adds a layer of depth to this age-old rhyme. Many outlandish origin theories have been put forward to explain the Hey Diddle Diddle nursery rhyme through the ages, including fantastical connections to ancient Greek phrases and the worship of Egyptian deities. One intriguing theory from history involves England's Queen Elizabeth I and her court. Queen Elizabeth had a playful nickname, the cat, because she liked to toy with her ministers. The little dog in our tale may refer to Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester, who Queen Elizabeth considered marrying. She even called him her little lapdog at times. As for the dish and the spoon, according to some sources, the courtier responsible for carrying ceremonial dishes at important state dinners was sometimes nicknamed the dish, and the spoon referred to a lady-in-waiting who had the risky job of tasting the queen's food to make sure it wasn't poisoned. Some speculate whether a secret love affair might have blossomed between the staff known as the dish and the spoon to inspire the line of the rhyme. However, the dish and the spoon may refer to two different characters of the royal court, for behind the grandeur and formality, a hidden romance was brewing. In the heart of Tudor England, where the palace walls concealed secrets darker than the night, a thrilling tale of forbidden love and royal betrayal unfolded. The formidable Queen Elizabeth I was set to embark on a grand hunting trip, but within the stone chambers of her court, a clandestine plot was underway. Lady Catherine Grey, with hair as fiery as her spirit, feigned toothache, for she harboured a secret engagement that could spell treason. Catherine, aged just eighteen, dared to defy the decree that bound her heart. To marry without the monarch's consent was to dance on the precipice of doom, yet she knew the Queen's blessing would never grace her union. For her betrothal to Edward Seymour, the first Earl of Hertford, threatened to rewrite the lines of succession to the throne. Under the cloak of Elizabeth's absence, Catherine embarked on a perilous journey to the Earl's estate. Edward's sister Jane stood as witness to their union, and a hushed ceremony sealed their fate. In the flickering candlelight, passion ignited their souls as they spent a stolen evening together. But as the night waned, Catherine slipped back away to the court, her heart heavy with the weight of her treacherous secret. In the following months, their love blossomed in the shadows, concealed from prying eyes. Amid stolen glances and fervent embraces, they defied fate itself. But whispers of Hartford's attention towards Catherine reached the ears of Sir William Cecil, the Secretary of State. 
Concerned that Hartford's affections would disrupt the royal order, he suggested an overseas journey, a command veiled in suggestion. The Duchess, mother to Hartford, lent her voice to this decree, hoping to secure a noble match for her son favoured by the Queen. With no choice but to obey, Hartford agreed to depart, leaving behind his love-stricken bride. Catherine's heart bore a heavy secret. She suspected she carried the fruit of their passion within her. Uncertain and torn, she grappled with the decision to reveal their forbidden union to the Queen. But a tragic turn of events diverted her thoughts. Her dear friend and now sister-in-law Jane fell gravely ill and was lost. Grief engulfed Catherine, casting a shadow over her heart. But as the months passed, Catherine's pregnancy could no longer be concealed. She had no choice but to reveal her secret to the enraged Queen. Elizabeth's fury raged like a tempest, her royal bloodline threatened by Catherine's transgression. Arrested and sent to the Tower of London, Catherine awaited her fate. Hartford, summoned back from Europe, also found himself imprisoned in the Tower upon his return. Even Hartford's mother distanced herself from her unruly child, pleading loyalty to the irate Queen. Amid the gloom of imprisonment, Catherine gave birth to a healthy son, christened Edward, on the 21st of September, 1561. Although the Queen's stern command demanded their separation, even the unyielding fortress of the Tower of London couldn't extinguish the flames of love that burned within Catherine and Hartford's hearts. The prison guards, moved by the palpable depth of their affection, chose to defy her orders. It was an act of compassion, for they witnessed the unbreakable bond that bound the couple together. Two years later, a second son came into this world, as a testament to the enduring love that defied the shackles of royal wrath and imprisonment. Yet their love was doomed. As news of a second son reached the ears of Queen Elizabeth, her wrath knew no bounds. She ordered the couple's separation miles apart and levied a staggering fine of 15,000 pounds on Hartford, equivalent to 3.5 million pounds today. They would never meet again. Catherine, confined to her prison, died in 1567 at the tender age of 27. Her pleas for Hartford's release on her deathbed fell on deaf ears. It is said that she perished with a broken heart, leaving behind a love story that dared to defy the crown and ignited the pages of history. Could it be that the ill-fated romance of Lady Catherine Grey serves as the embodiment of the dish and spoon in our rhyme? This intriguing possibility further strengthens our theory that the origins of this enigmatic verse may indeed be intertwined with the court of Queen Elizabeth I. It's a poignant tale, yet the nursery rhyme's connection to it remains shrouded in obscurity, lacking concrete evidence. If we are to look for hard evidence beyond the familiar printed rendition we recognise today, a rare historical reference in a play by Thomas Preston dated back to 1569 may hold a clue, it reads, They be at hand, sir, with stick and fiddle. They can play a new dance called Hey Diddle Diddle. Another possible reference is in Alexander Montgomery's book of poetry, The Cherry and the Sleigh, from 1597. But since you think it an easy thing to mount above the moon, of your own fiddle take a spring and dance when you have done. Both of these early printed versions undeniably suggest a dance, which possibly served as the genesis of the nursery rhyme. It's conceivable that the remaining lines of the modern rhyme we recognise today evolved to harmonise with the music that once accompanied this dance. However, it's essential to tread cautiously, as the resemblance between these texts and the rhyme could be purely coincidental, raising doubts about their true connection. One last theory is that the rhyme might have served as a simple inventory of essentials within a poor household, a cat to catch vermin, a dog for protection, a cow for milk, a dish and spoon for food, and a fiddle for musical entertainment. While each one of these origin theories holds merit, the enduring mystery surrounding this rhyme persists. Many sources conclude that it is just a playful, nonsensical wordplay with no deeper meaning. The answer remains elusive, leaving room for interpretation and speculation. But what do you think? Leave us a comment and share your thoughts. Thank you for all your comments, encouragement and imaginative contributions to our nursery rhyme journey so far. Your support means the world to me and I'm passionately dedicated to making videos that will continue to intrigue and enchant your hearts. Until we meet again, keep venturing into the unknown, unearthing spine-chilling facts and feeding your insatiable curiosity. See you in a future video.